Um, this is a Jim Thompson oral history project, and this recording is made on uh, the 11th of February, uh, 2016. My name is uh, William Klossner. Um, I first came to Thailand in 1955. Uh, I was born in New York. I had studied uh, <coughs> at Yale undergraduate school, law school, and then graduate studies in um, Asian studies, Southeast Asian studies. I received a grant from the Ford Foundation uh, to come to Thailand to do an ethnographic study on cultural barriers to modernization um, in a uh, rural context. I had chosen the Northeast because very few academic studies had been carried out by Westerners at that time or by Thais themselves concerning the Northeast. And I chose Ubon and ultimately spent 12 months in a small village in Ubon, Thailand. Actually, when I arrived in Thailand from, <coughs> uh, I had spent three months in India uh, concerning uh, cultural barriers to modernization in rural India. Uh, but going from uh, village to village, area to area in India. I arrived in Thailand, and the day after I arrived in Thailand, I had a, uh, in my uh, pocket, a note uh, that a uh, rather renowned linguist, uh, uh, John Bill Gedney, um, who was uh, at that time at Yale with his wife, um, uh, Choi Gedney. Um, I had a letter uh, from Bill Gedney to uh, Jim Thompson, who uh, Gedney knew uh, quite well. Um, uh, for several years um, in the late 40s and early uh, 50s. I, I arrived in 55. Um, I took the letter uh, to uh, the uh, Thai Silk Company and uh, was escorted up to Jim's office and um, and that was when I first met Jim Thompson. He was most gracious. I was an impoverished academic whom he certainly did not know. Uh, but of course he knew Gedney and asked me how, how Gedney was and what he was doing. And then asked me what I was uh, doing in Thailand and I told him I was carrying out an ethnographic study in Uban. Um, Jim said that um, it was uh, a very ambitious project and he uh, was uh, quite positive about uh, doing the study in the Northeast where he said he had spent many uh, uh, hours and days and, and and had many friends in the Northeast and encouraged me to do uh, the study there. Uh, being gracious as always, Jim said, well, why don't you come for dinner uh, tomorrow evening? Um, and explained where the house was at that time in 
Lumpany, uh, and um, I said it would be an honor, and I, uh, I did so. When I arrived at the house, there was uh, one other uh, guest who was a rather old-time friend of Jim, a famous photographer, Huey Cranin, um, who had actually become quite famous because he did the calendars for Pan Am. He was uh, an avid collector, much like Jim, and they used to go out every weekend uh, when Ewing was in town um, on their uh, uh, travels up country for uh, collecting uh, various OJ uh, paintings, sculptures, etc. Um, unlike Jim, who was more selective in what he uh, um, uh, found and uh, negotiated for, uh, Ewing always was known as uh, uh, better by the dozen. He would try <laughs> to collect a dozen of whatever, or six of whatever he was uh, looking for. Um, that evening that we had dinner, uh, and another example of uh, Jim's both sense of style and graciousness, was that as we were having dinner, Jim had arranged that in the garden, uh, there would be mu two musicians from Isan, from the northeast, playing on their can and bamboo pipes uh, for the entire dinner. It was uh, both uh, romantic and I thought after three months in India I had arrived in heaven. Um, so that was the first time I met Jim and then uh, just a week or two later, I went off for 12 months in the village in Uban. When I returned, um, I stayed for a time uh, in Bangkok uh, before traveling uh, throughout Southeast Asia with Ewing Cranon, actually carrying his bags as a uh, ferrop. <laughs> Uh, photographer assistant for three months. I then went to back to the States at Yale where I wrote up my material, materials and prepared for a book, uh, my first book on uh, Thai village life. Uh, when I returned after that nine month period, uh, I remained basically in Thailand for the rest of the time to the present, February 11th, 2016. Um, I uh, continued a uh, friendship with Jim during that, Jim Thompson during that period. Um, my impressions of life uh, during that period, uh, which would have been 19, that would have been, uh, yeah, 1990, 1956, uh, merging into seven, uh, 1957, um, was um, a city that uh, would be totally uh, unrecognizable uh, today. It was a city filled with canals, and actually Thailand at that time was known as the Venice of the East. Um, and there were trolleys, uh, there were um, uh, cars certainly, but uh, no traffic. Um, and one could easily go from uh, one part of town to the other in only a few minutes. 
Um, I remember uh, at that at that time my first uh, career appointment was with uh, the Asia Foundation, later with uh, Ford and Rockefeller. But in those early years, I remember if one wanted to concerning a project in development, if one wanted to uh, meet a director general or a, a deputy minister, um, one would never think of calling them on the telephone. Of course, at that time, there were no emails. Um, so you would get in your car and you would go across town in a relatively few minutes and you would meet the government official and have the opportunity to both in body language as well as verbally uh, show your respect, etc. It was a time, a uh, gracious time, a uh, genteel time, uh, whatever the political situation may have been, uh, whatever military government was in power, um, or later civilian uh, governments, uh, it was a, a time of gentility and graciousness. And of course, uh, Jim, in his persona, uh, represented those values of civility and charm and sense of style and uh, graciousness. Um, and uh, he was the social lion of Bangkok at that time. Um, Anyone who came through Thailand had a letter of recommendation, whether they came from Europe or Africa or whatever, South America, uh, uh, the U.S., uh, movie stars, princes, uh, and uh, such as myself, a impoverished academic. Um, and he would invite, uh, everyone had a letter to Jim, as I had had, of introduction, and he would invite them, uh, including people, uh, relatives of friends uh, whom he didn't know, uh, but they would be invited for drinks or for uh, dinner. And of course, uh, the dinners were romantic on the veranda uh, of uh, Jim's house or houses, um, candlelit usually. Um, and you, you were in a time when uh, the Jim actually uh, there were parties, uh, certainly by the uh, embassy, uh, embassy groups or business groups, but uh, in terms of parties with, shall we say, status and uh, uh, panache, uh, it would certainly be Jim. And at the parties, um, Jim always had his cockatoo, uh, white cockatoo, perched on his shoulder uh, as the conversations uh, waned and <laughs> increased uh, with Italian opera uh, in the background. And the cockatoo, as Jim pointed out, was always uh, with his wings or claws, uh, making certain movements, which Jim um, encouraged us to believe uh, he was conducting. The cockatoo was mimicking a conductor. 
Actually, when Jim went uh, to parties outside, he often uh, went with the cockatoo. <laughs> um, those happy halcyon days uh, <laughs> of uh, wonderfully, perhaps, as one might think, eccentric, uh, but also uh, charm um, would be difficult to find today. Um, what was um, Jim's motivation in staying on in Thailand um, in uh, initiating uh, the uh, Thai Silk uh, Company um, in making his life as an expatriate here? Um, my own impression um, was that uh, both the company and um, initially and later uh, his um, fascination and his desire to collect in a few basic areas, uh, Roche Da, which represented the traditional cultural heritage in artistic terms um, of Thailand. Um, I think that the motivation for the collection was his fascination with Thailand, his commitment to Thailand, and his general interest whether it came from his um, background in uh, the U.S. Uh, or whether it came from family or whether it came uh, perhaps from his travels uh, and his uh, commitment to Northeast Thailand, um, where um, he uh, met and was friends with people from the Lao Itsara movement uh, against the colonial uh, governments, um, uh, from the friendly and uh, religious uh, population of the Northeast. Um, and he began a love affair with uh, the northeast of Thailand with its culture um, and he saw that there was a thriving uh, silk industry. Uh, many reports that you will hear is that Jim uh, in effect uh, from uh, created uh, the Thai uh, silk uh, weaving industry. No, there was a very vibrant uh, village uh, in uh, industry uh, because at that time in rural Thailand it was a barter economy and um, the clothes one more uh, were not purchased. Uh, they came from the woo, from the loom. Um, uh, some uh, for uh, just daily wear, uh, but some of them for ceremonial and so uh, purposes. Uh, so uh, one, there was this thriving local uh, industry. Uh, not thought of as an industry, but rather as a home uh, blue, uh, working the loom uh, in order for one's uh, daily and ceremonial uh, clothing. What Jim did was he saw immediately the opportunity to take this traditional uh, silk weaving and cotton uh, weaving 
industry and uh, give it, uh, make it an international uh, uh, brand. Uh, and uh, that uh, he did that through his, uh, 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 I think they were German uh, dyes at that time. Uh, so that you would have fast colors uh, rather than uh, the village uh, dyes, which of course were vegetable dyes and bark dyes, etc., which you will see in uh, maybe upcountry in Luang Prabang, uh, but no longer uh, in uh, uh, rural uh, Thailand. Um, and then um, uh, giving, also being uh, conversant with Western tastes and colors and designs, uh, building on traditional patterns, etc. Uh, so Jim uh, brought that village industry to effectively uh, to international renown uh, through the Thai Silk Company. Um, I often, uh, Jim often would have lunch at the uh, sports club. Uh, he, he swam and had lunch there with a few friends. I often had the opportunity to join him uh, and uh, later with Bill Booth and others. Uh, Sassoon was a great friend of his from the Sassoon family in England. Um, people ask about uh, Jim's uh, disappearance. <coughs> uh, Jim, as you, as people know, uh, let, um, went to the Cameron Highlands with friends. Uh, uh, and he disappeared during um, his uh, stay in the Cameron Highlands in 1967. Um, he went in the company of Dr. Hammondson and Connie Manskow, uh, who were dear friends and friends from Singapore. People also often ask about the disappearance, and it has always been my personal belief that it is a mystery <coughs> and should remain a mystery. Uh, all of the various uh, scenarios that uh, people uh, with both good and one assumes personal agendas or uh, intentions um, have offered all of them. There has been no uh, proof. And so it is best uh, to avoid uh, conspiracies, theories, etc., uh, for it to remain as a mystery. Seven years after According to international law, the <coughs> uh, one must wait seven years, and Thai has uh, followed that international law. One must wait seven years before one can be declared legally dead. Now. Um, during that period, um, the house uh, was uh, kept up. Um, it was uh, known uh, that it was actually registered during Jim's time. It's my un understanding that it was re registered as a uh, national museum. 
uh, not a heritage site because there's a legal difference between a heritage site and a national museum. I think it would, Jim felt that it would be um, easier if it was a national museum uh, because then one could make renovations uh, when necessary on the house. If, if it was a heritage site, as an example, you would have to ask permission uh, from the uh, fine arts department, even if you wanted to replace one tile in the roof. Um, so it was clearly known that Jim's intention was that his entire collection, as well as the house, which was of course the house you see today, um, would uh, remain uh, in Thailand and would be an exemplar of traditional uh, Thai cultural heritage. Now, during that period of seven years, uh, we began, and uh, I use the editorial that we, as uh, several of Jim's friends, um, decided to establish uh, the foundation. Uh, at the same time, there was, of course, a search for uh, Jim's will. Uh, uh, therein, uh, the saga began. Uh, originally, Jim had um, willed uh, the house and its collection to the Siam Society. Um, however, during the time Jim uh, was still alive, um, his house was raided by the uh, Thai police under the auspices of the Fine Arts uh, Department uh, to um, charge and take possession, charged him and take possession of certain uh, Buddha images and Obje Da um, as, quote, stolen property. Well, um, whatever their uh, provenance, uh, Jim, of course, had made it quite clear that, and by registering as a national museum, that this collection would remain in Thailand and be available to the Thai public and the Thai nation. Uh, Jim felt um, one can speculate on uh, what the uh, reason for uh, the Department of Art, uh, Department of Fine Arts, to take this step was, uh, and uh, I think it's best not at this time to speculate, but that was the reality. Jim felt. Um, understandably that the Siam Society, to whom the house, etc., had been left, had not um, supported him uh, by taking a strong position. And of course, the Siam Society at that time, um, if my memory serves me, there was a uh, well-known uh, royal figure who was the uh, president and certainly there were many influential uh, uh, ties involved in the society and uh, Jim felt he had not received the support that uh, he should have and therefore he decided to change his will. 
which he did, and the second will, uh, which of course uh, took precedence over the first will, uh, left it to his nephew, Henry Thompson. However, <laughs> Jim uh, had left the will uh, in the midst in uh, the midst of the architectural plans for the uh, house, uh, and so when people looked for the will. They couldn't find it until uh, one day it was found in the midst of all these architectural plans. So now we have the the will, leaving it to Henry. We have Jim disappearing, mm -hmm. um, and. We have, of course, the house, uh, which we realize should become uh, under a uh, care, and uh, several of his uh, close friends, um, of which I was honored to be one, um, established the foundation with um, uh, Prince Supatra bin Diskun as its first president. Um, now, in creating the foundation, um, we, of course, wanted to continue to uh, monitor of the house and to be certain that it was protected. Um, actually, it had been opened to the public, um, I believe, three times a week, as I remember it, perhaps only in the mornings. Um, and there were volunteers uh, from the uh, community. Uh, usually wives of uh, business people or embassy people who uh, were the docents at, at the house. And the funds uh, that were generated um, uh, were, went to Jim's favorite charity, which I believe was uh, Blind, uh, uh, a foundation for the blind. Uh, during that period, uh, the foundation, uh, as I said, uh, monitored and controlled uh, the house, and uh, I believe it was a Mr. Riley or someone who was uh, stayed at the house uh, to sort of keep watch over it. During that time, the servants were kept on, um, and one should appreciate that Jim had left uh, I don't think it was actually stipulated in the will, but the Thai Silk Company, during that seven-year period, kept uh, Jim's salary, and it was that money, Jim's salary, uh, that was used when needed uh, for, uh, you know, to uh, pay the staff uh, who we in the foundation decided uh, to keep on. I think if my memory serves me <laughs> correctly, um, the foundation was not actually uh, put into legal form until the seven-year period passed. Uh, 
and it may be, as, uh, as I say, my memory feels, it was not uh, uh, during that seven period, it had not yet been officially formed. Uh, it was formed actually by the time all the paperwork was done, I think it was eight years after, which would put it in uh, 1975. Uh, now, uh, that was the uh, will <laughs> issue solved. That was the foundation uh, form. And then, alas, um, the IRS in the United States raised its devilish head and um, decided to sue uh, the foundation uh, and the sue actually in uh, legal terms sue Henry, Henry Thompson who had graciously transferred uh, the the house and all its objects to the foundation the IRS contended that um, this uh, the foundation was uh, a ghost foundation. It was done to evade death taxes. Um, there were um, allegations that the foundation uh, board was uh, siphoning off funds, um, uh, receiving uh, salaries, uh, exorbitant salaries, uh, uh, objet d'art were being sold, all of which were uh, complete fabrications, or from the very beginning of the foundation to the present time, uh, all the members all the board members and the president receive uh, no salaries and it is all for, uh, pro bono. And of course, no objects were ever uh, stolen. Uh, unfortunately, uh, over time, uh, we have lost a few poche uh, da uh, through uh, thefts. Uh, uh, the two times I remember, they, uh, the thieves came in with M16 guns and the guards and uh, etc. were not prepared to put up a fight. Um, and uh, several Oje were, lo were lost. Other than that, um, as I say, the collection remains and both in storage and in see uh, to in the house uh, as it was when Jim was alive. Although there have been changes in the actual placement, etc. So um, there was the issue of now um, and it was a very uh, tense Time, as this case brought by the IRS uh, wove its way through the court system in the United States. If the IRS had succeeded, we would not be sitting here today <laughs> giving an oral uh, uh, history. Uh, because the foundation would, <laughs> nor the house, nor the collection would be here. Because if um, Henry uh, 
lost the case uh, given the amount of money uh, that the house represented and that collection, I'm afraid poor Henry would have gone bankrupt and would have been necessary to sell the house or sell the collection. Fortunately, we are here today giving an oral history. The house is here um, with, uh, at the present time, uh, more than a thousand visitors a day and uh, remains one of the major, five major uh, tourist sites in uh, Thailand. What happened with the case? Well, actually, it's an interesting story. Um, the case went on for quite a few years, and during that time, it appeared uh, that uh, one could not actually predict the outcome. And that was a very ne nervous period for everyone, including Henry, and including those of us who were involved in establishing the foundation. Um, there is, uh, fortunately, in, in the U.S. Uh, tax system, uh, there's a tax code every year, and there are exceptions to uh, certain taxes. Um, and these are, as I suppose in any country, including the U.S., uh, subject to certain pressures and influences. And, um, both a corporation, as I understand it, or individuals can be exempted and listed in the tax code for whatever year. Uh, so we approached, the foundation approached the senator from uh, Pennsylvania, I believe, Arnold Specter who was a senator, senator for many years. Um, and we uh, initiated, the board initiated, an approach to ask for his good offices in the Senate to represent uh, the foundation and the desire to maintain uh, the, the house, its collection, etc., which had been transferred to the foundation. Um, the senator uh, uh, was very uh, positive and said that uh, he would take the case under advisement and so depositions had to be given because during that time there were again allegations about uh, the ghost foundation uh, that this foundation was set up to avoid uh, death taxes uh, to uh, the uh, members of the board was siphoning off of the same type of allegations that one had heard in the past. Um, and so the various members of the foundation uh, were asked to give depositions uh, concerning these allegations and uh, in a more positive way uh, uh, explain what uh, the purpose of the house as an exemplar of uh, traditional cultural heritage and uh, for all the world to see and uh, have public come, et cetera, et cetera. And I personally, I can only tell you my personal experience, uh, which is uh, in one way quite amusing and in another way quite enlightening. Um, 
I was going to the United States uh, to visit my family and um, also go to Yale University to visit friends. And I was asked by Bill Booth uh, to uh, give a dep deposition at, to the senator's office, to the senator in the office. When I arrived in the States, I called uh, Washington and um, discussed, uh, and, and I got on the phone with the uh, chief uh, staff aide to the senator. I explained um, the mission I had to give the deposition. He said he was with, familiar with the case. Uh, and um, over the phone, he asked all of these, uh, you know, issues and allegations. I uh, refuted uh, any of those that um, needed to be refuted and said we we're all Pope Bono, uh, the, a very renowned uh, prince was the president of the foundation. Um, Noah, Noel J. Da had been um, sold or given away, and et cetera, et cetera. And we went on for about 20 minutes, 30 minutes. And then I said, um, well, if you need to ask any further questions, I am going to New Haven. Uh, and you can contact me. I'm staying with uh, the head of the uh, history department, a dear friend, and his number is such and such. And he said, why are you going to New Haven? And I said, well, um, I am an alum, alumnus of Yale, uh, actually from several schools, uh, undergraduate law school, graduate school, all at Yale. And I have dear friends there. And he said, oh, you went to Yale. And I said, yes. He said, well, you know, my senator went to Yale. Uh, I hadn't known that, but I quickly said, well, I, uh, yes, he's one of our most famous uh, alumni. And then he said, well, I don't think we have to discuss this any longer. I take everything you have said as the verbatim truth. So, the tie that binds. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the old boy network, or whatever it is called, it was alive and well then. And I'm not so, <laughs> I don't know how alive or well it is today, but then it was. So, he was successful, he put it in the tax code, the senator, and the rest is history. And here we are today. Um, concerning the memory of uh, Jim Thompson, uh, personally, I feel very strongly that um, the foundation um, objective, its mission, was and remains uh, to preserve Jim Thompson's legacy. Um, not only in terms of the Thai Silk Company and legacy, and one should remember that Jim actually, many people believe that Jim owned uh, uh, the Thai Silk Company. Actually, he only had 20% of its shares, uh, but of course, uh, the name, his persona, uh, etc., was 
uh, a part of the brand of the, uh, uh, the international uh, uh, brand of the Tyson company. And it was that, it was his salary uh, uh, as manager uh, that was the fund kept and which was used to buy the foundation. So, uh, one, to preserve Jim's legacy. Uh, as, as I say, not only uh, his business uh, persona, but also his persona as one sincerely committed uh, to the preservation and uh, dissemination of Thailand's rich cultural heritage through uh, the uh, Jim Thompson Museum uh, House. And the foundation in its work over the years uh, has uh, attempted to the best of its ability uh, to uh, preserve uh, that uh, legacy in both his personas, one as a collector uh, and committed to preserving Thai cultural heritage and the other, uh, his role in the uh, as bringing silk, Thai silk to international fame. So that's Jim's memory. Um, and it is preserved, and uh, one hopes uh, that in, in the future, and we certainly see every day in terms of the uh, visitors uh, coming to the house, that uh, I think Jim would be pleased and proud that so many people have a better understanding of Thailand's artistic heritage and of the importance of Thai silk uh, as an international brand. So uh, that, I think, um, completes the first part um, of uh, the oral history. And now I would like if uh, particularly uh, both uh, Jane and Bruno who have uh, initiated uh, this particular project uh, would have any uh, further questions uh, that I might reply to. Thank you. One question is, I have. Is this still going on? Yeah. Yeah, okay. One question I have is, do you have any idea why people made allegations against the foundation? Do you have any, what, what was behind this? Uh, well, it's a good question, Jane. I must say I personally um, have uh, no specific idea. I had heard that there was some disgruntled um, investors uh, who had invested in the Thai Silk Company. And for whatever reasons, and as I say, I, have, I really don't have any idea, were uh, disgruntled and uh, they, uh, they were the initiators of these idea. But I, I have no real proof. And as I say, this is just uh, what uh, I heard uh, as gossip, perhaps, or uh, perhaps it was true, perhaps it wasn't. I really have no idea. But there were these allocations uh, made. And my other question, you, you mentioned that you often had lunch with uh, Jim Thompson or some time to time at the, the Royal Bangkok Sports Club. Right. What, in a casual relationship when you were at lunch, what was it like to talk to him? What Was he outgoing? 
Uh, did he talk about his business, or was he engaged in listening to other people? What's your memory of those? Well, I think much like um, when uh, at his dinners, uh, I think it was like a salon. Mm -hmm. uh, the 18th century, I think, salons of France, uh, or 17th century, Madame de Sévigné, I, I don't know the exact dates, but it was like a salon at that time. It was just uh, charming, gracious, uh, enjoyable conversation about whatever the topic of of the day might be. It might be there was just a coup, it might be uh, just some uh, social gossip, it might uh, have just been uh, you know, Norman, normal, casual con conversation. It was not in my memory that political. I mean, Jim's views concerning the Vietnam War, et cetera, and there have been several books that have uh, touted this, his, um, his very strong views. But uh, the, this was not, uh, the impression given by some of these writers was that, you know, this consumed Jim and also might have been uh, involved in his disappearance, etc., etc. Um, actually, um, at the social occasions, uh, certainly that I uh, was present at, it was never um, uh, brought up in terms of the passionate uh, <laughs> Uh, part of a conversation going on in dinner and arguments, etc. No, it was more like a salon with just clever uh, conversation, enjoyable conversation, amusing conversation. That is my own memory. Uh, as I say, uh, obviously there were other <laughs> many other occasions that I was not present at, and I certainly don't want to give the impression that I was a, you know, a very, very close uh, friend. No, I was a friend to Jim, and I respected him uh, as my elder, um, and, uh, but, uh, whether he conversed with others who were closer to him in a more political context, I have no idea. I can only tell you in terms of my own experience. Bruce. Yes, I'm thinking about uh, financially how Jim could purchase a lot of uh, objects and right buy the land, then buy the land, then right. build the house. So for me, well, uh, I, I heard he had an heritage, uh, something different from his own salary from the Tyson. Oh, uh, of yeah. course, I assume that he had family uh, yeah. money. Uh, and also, uh, Bruno, I, my impression, you know, that was back in you know, the 50s, late 50s. Uh, many people didn't even know that there was a Thailand or a Siam. Uh, the visitors who came through, you know, whether it was Somerset Mom or something, uh, you know, at a certain level of uh, high so throughout the world, yes. But the average, <laughs> people uh, certainly didn't know Thailand, and there wasn't a large tourist industry. So I think the actual costs that uh, Jim spent were, were not that exorbitant. And also, when he went up country, I know for a fact that he didn't purchase, uh, you know, when he stopped in uh, temples, etc., uh, or was taken to temples. Very often, the pieces, the uh, 
paintings as an example uh, that he obtained were thrown behind a bookcase or something and were fraying and he uh, offered a modest contribution to the temple uh, to make merit and they gave it. or he would uh, give uh, the Japanese uh, what um, imitations or uh, Japanese sort of a modern uh, story, uh, uh, Buddhist, you know, of the same Buddhist stories, but done in prints or something, and uh, the temples would love that. It was all very colorful and etc. So I think the actual expenditures, there may have been some major pieces that he drew on family funds, etc. But you know, it wasn't that expensive. My question, Cam, because uh, I think during the starting early 60s, um, he started to buy, Jim started to buy a lot of important antiques, like the sculptures. Right. And at the time, also the price of these. Were antiques, they going up? Yeah, going yeah. up because the international collector, amongst them the Rockefeller, Rockefeller family, uh, start to come to Bangkok uh, and purchase important works of art. And I read that in, I think Warren said that in, a, in the book that sometimes Jim get completely broke. You know, he got his bonus, he spent all well, for uh, something because he went to Peng Seng shop or one right. side shop. He spent all his money and just... Well, you The cost of living was low, so he could spend all the money, right. yeah. <laughs> something like that. But I tried to imagine at that time if when he purchased this beautiful uh, sculpture, uh, was something very, very, very expensive at that time or comparable to what we have well, today now? Well, certainly or? not comparable. Not comparable. Yeah. Certainly. Talk, talking about collectors, to me the Swan Pagat Museum mm -hmm. is very similar. Was, uh, and, and even what some of the things in the collection, although there was more right. later, but was there a link? I mean, I, was Jim Thompson friends near, do you know, with Princess Trimpu? And, and I, I, I don't know personally, uh, but you know I expect certainly Jim knew uh, royalty. Uh, as you know, I mean the Queen shopped, uh, you know, <laughs> and so uh, and of course the Discoons uh, were in involved in the foundation because uh, they had been friends of Jim, uh, Prince Supatrinid. So um, I think, so, again, some of the books have said he, you know, he didn't have royal friends, etc. He did, uh, and he traveled in those circles as, as well. So I, I would be surprised if he hadn't known uh, Princess So uh, that uh, one, one, actually one more yeah. question. Um, it, after the, it's obvious when Jim Thompson came to Thailand, he was very impressed and he was very with the Thai people and everything. After the problems with the fine arts department. Mm -hmm. And the changing situation here, do you think he became, in your sense, did he become a little more sour? Did he change a little disappointed with Thailand? Or did he continue to seem committed to being here? Oh, I, I think there's no question that he was committed. He certainly could have returned to the States and been, you know, quite a famous figure on the East Coast and with all the magazines, and, uh, et cetera. Um, uh, but I think uh, Jim uh, remained, and perhaps he knew the background of why this uh, raid was made, and I think he um, just uh, 
felt still very committed to Thailand and has shown, uh, you know, to uh, his continued stay here and commitment. So uh, I expect that that's, uh, it was something he, it certainly was a disappointment, but I don't think he uh, really was disappointed in Thailand so much as certain elements uh, uh, in Thailand. So that completes the uh, first, or perhaps, uh, hopefully, of many oral histories uh, in Thailand. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.